If I could ask everybody to take your seats and settle in, we're about ready to begin. As a reminder to the audience and the board, we video and audio record our meetings. So to the board, if you would kindly remember to push your button when you have something to say on the record and then push it when you are finished. We have one participant on the phone, Director Buchanan. Uh, Director Buchanan, if I could ask you to mute your phone when you aren't speaking so we don't have a lot of background noise in case there is any from your side. And so okay. with that, I will turn it over to Director McGallis, our chairman. Uh, excuse me, um, I'm also on the phone. This is Rose Lang Poston with Aon. Okay, we won't need you until the next meeting. <laughs> uh, okay, what, what time would that be? And I'll uh, call back shortly. In. So we're not to get off. Rose. You can stay oh, okay. on the phone too. Oh, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> would the, uh, I'll call the Finance Com Committee meeting to order. Would the Secretary please call the roll? Director Anderson. The conference. Director Buchanan. Are you there? I thought he was. Okay. Director Colson. Here. Director DeWitt. Here. Director Lewis. Present. Director Triani. Here. Director McGallis. Here. We have a quorum of five present with two absent. If the record would also show that, directors Durante, Frega, Fuentes, Hobson, Pang, Ross, Totten, and Chairman Dillard are also present. Thank you. Item number two is approval of the minutes from the meeting held on April 21st, 2016. Are there any questions or comments? If not, uh, is there a motion? So moved. Motion by Director Lewis, seconded by Director Tarani. Uh, roll call. Director Colson? Yes. Director DeWitt? Yes. Director Lewis? Yes. Director Triani? Yes. Director McGallis? Aye. Five ayes and two absent. Thank you. Item 3A, a presentation of the quarterly performance report. Donna? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Director McGallis and members of the Finance Committee and other members of the Board. I will be presenting first quarter performance results. We provide this report on a quarterly basis at the same time that you were reviewing quarterly budget results to certify the service boards are in substantial accordance with their budget. The performance comparisons are to the prior year, and so I will be comparing first quarter performance to first quarter 2015. First, I will review, review ridership performance. Using data from the National Transit Database, we can see ridership trends for the first quarter of each year going back to 2002. You can see a low point in 2003 following a recessionary period after the 9-11 attacks. Ridership continued to rise through 2009, and then we hit the financial crisis and we had some flattening and declining of ridership. First quarter ridership peaked in 2012, that's the highest bar there on the chart, when it totaled 161.5 million I'm rides. Going to conference. 2012 marked the highest annual ridership since 1990. 2012 ridership was followed by three years of declining ridership in 2013, 2014, and 2015. The 2013 decline was occurring primarily on CTA, following the elimination of 13 bus routes in December 2012 and the January 2013 CTA fare increase. 2014, as we remember, was the winter of the polar vortex, followed by another severe winter in 2015, which led to lower ridership in those winter quarters. For 2016, we are seeing a slight increase, just 0.3%, compared to 2015 for first quarter ridership. Overall, though, if we look at ridership compared to 2002 over the 15-year period, we see a 5% increase. This chart shows RTA system ridership by mode for the first quarter of 2016, and it's represented by the blue bars there, with an orange dot within each bar representing the peer average ridership, ridership performance for that mode. CTA bus ridership is down 2% compared to 2015, and rail ridership was 3.3% higher. In both cases, performance is somewhat better than its peers. Metro ridership was down just 0.3%, so almost flat, but Metro did implement a 2% fare increase on February 1st. Peer bu uh, pace bus showed a 0.5% ridership increase for the first quarter of 2016. This is encouraging in two respects. As you remember, pace has seen several periods of declining ridership. Also, in comparison to its peers, who had an average 2.4% decrease in ridership, PACE's performance is quite good. 
Vanpool, however, experienced deeper losses, ending the quarter 6.7% below first quarter 2015. But as you can see, it's right similar, it's right on target with its peers. ADA Paratransit continued its growth with a 7% increase in early 2016. Okay. Here is a look at first quarter 2016 peer regional ridership compared to 2015. This chart shows year-over-year -year regional ridership using the same peer metropolitan areas that we use in our annual peer review. The Chicago region, as you can see, is in the middle of the pack there in orange with a 0.3% ridership increase. Houston, at the top of the chart, has the highest rate of growth, 8.6%, and that's related to the opening of two new light rail lines last year in May and the restructuring of its bus routes to take advantage of those rail lines. So that was quite significant improvement for Houston. On our last chart, we are looking at a few of the service and financial measures. 2016 performance is looking quite good. Green arrows reflect favorable performance, and we see four of them here, along with two orange arrows showing change of less than 1%. There were slight increases in service as measured by vehicle revenue hours and vehicle revenue miles, which were each up about 2%. Regional operating costs, after being adjusted for inflation, were up only 0.2%. So they were basically flat, and when combined with increased service, resulted in an improvement in the operating cost per vehicle revenue hour metric, which was down 1.7%, an improvement over the first quarter of 2015. The operating cost per passenger trip remained stable at $4.35, and the fare revenue per passenger trip increased by four cents to $1.56, a difference of 2.9%, and again, the metro fare increase contributed to that improvement. The fare recovery sh ratio shown here reflects the ratio of fare revenue to operating expenses without any credits or exclusions. The first quarter of 2016 had a recovery ratio of 35.7%, which is an improvement of 0 0.8 percentage points over the first quarter of 2015. So overall, we're seeing positive results for the first quarter of the year. That concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Donna. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. Yes, Director Lewis. This, this is a small kind of, uh, comment on the quarter situation. So in the future, we could, um, we could denote um, negative performance with a red <laughs> versus the same color. It just makes it easier kind of stands out a little bit more on the chart. So if you have a negative decline, it could be in red versus blue. So yeah. we, do do, we do use red arrows for negative. The reason that that arrow is going down but is green is because it's a positive thing when that metric shows a decline in performance. So the operating cost per vehicle revenue hour, it's good that it's going down. No, no, the bar charts. I uh, like the bar oh. charts. Uh, I, I said arrows. I should have said bar charts. Um, small thing. Nip oh, pick. yes. Okay, gotcha. Okay. okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Director Ross. <coughs> Is there any explanation for why Vanpool would be down 6.7% but yet uh, well, Pace's performance overall would be improved? Well, we find Vanpool is very susceptible to gas prices, so gas prices have been very low um, and dropped to their lowest point in the first quarter of 2016. So that could be a contributing factor, so we'll have to see how that goes. But Vanpool does tend to go up and down quite a bit, and so um, there's more variance in it altogether, and it does respond more to both the economy and gas prices. Okay. Uh, Director Hobson. Uh, last month, we talked about uh, paces uh, being off in terms of their ridership projections, right. and it, it looks like at least for the first quarter they're 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 flat based on the numbers you've just shared. Have is what are they anticipating for the year? I mean, do they think through four quarters that they'll continue to be flat, or that the trend that we have been seeing of uh, their ridership being down? I think we were looking at about six percent down last month. Right, we were, it was significant. I think that they have revised their ridership projection. Yeah, you yes, to take that they point? have revised their ridership projection. I'll cover that in just a few minutes. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. No other questions or comments? Thank you very much, Don. Okay. Item 4A, resolutions uh, certifying the financial results for the first quarter of 2016. Bill? Yes, thank you. We're just getting set up.
presentation been switched? Have you joined the call? Hello. Director Buchanan? Yes. Okay, good. Let's now review the first quarter financial results for 2016, which are subject to board approval. A comprehensive written report about the first quarter financial and performance results was distributed earlier today. The Service Board's results for first quarter 2016 were satisfactory. Operating revenue was impacted by unfavorable ridership and continued uncertainty about state funding for reduced fare and free rides. However, strong expense performance aided by low fuel prices led to favorable operating results. At the end of the presentation, I'll be recommending that the Board certify that the results of operations for each Service Board and the region as a whole are in substantial accordance with the adopted 2016 budget. First, some background on regional employment, which can impact ridership, revenue, and sales tax receipts. During the first quarter, Chicago area employment increased by 36,300 positions, while the labor force grew by about 57,000 people. Job growth encouraged even more workers to join the labor force. As a result, the regional unemployment rate grew by 0.4 percentage points to 6.5 percent. This level lagged the national rate of 5 percent. Returning your attention to the screen, year-to-date system ridership was 1.9 percent lower than budget for the first quarter. As shown by the orange bars on the chart, system ridership for January and March was unfavorable to budget and lower than prior year. February ridership was higher than prior year due to leap day, but like January and March, it was unfavorable to budget. Low gasoline prices and the metro fare increase contributed to the unfavorable ridership results. Returning to the ridership summary, CTA ridership was 2.1% under budget, but 0.4% higher than prior year. Bus ridership was 4% unfavorable, while first quarter rail ridership was at budget. Metro ridership was 1% unfavorable to budget as customers continued to respond to the 2015 and 2016 fare increases and sustained low gasoline prices. Pace provided the, rider Pace provided the RTA with their revised 2016 ridership projection for suburban service. There are two reasons for this adjustment. PACE's actual ridership for 2015 came in lower than PACE estimated when it prepared its 2016 budget last summer. Also, PACE delayed the start of some new services in 2016. Against the revised projection, PACE suburban service ridership finished the quarter 0.9% unfavorable to budget. It was essentially flat versus the first quarter of 2015. Regional ADA paratransit ridership was higher than prior year, but 0.8% unfavorable to budget. System operating revenues were 0.9 million, or 0.3% unfavorable to budget, primarily due to, to the lower level of state reduced fare funding being reported by each of the service boards. Fare revenue was favorable to budget for Metra, at budget for CTA, and slightly unfavorable for PACE suburban service and for PACE ADA paratransit service. PACE suburban service operating revenue was 1.4 million or 9.9% .9 unfavorable to budget 
as you see here highlighted in red. Please note that the fare box revenue for pay suburban service was only 1.1% or 0.1 million unfavorable. This reflects lower than budgeted ridership. Shortfalls in state reduced fare funding and lower than budgeted advertising and investment in income accounted for more than 90% of the unfavorability in the operating revenue for Pace Suburban Service. Pace ADA recorded unfavorable operating revenue of 0.4 million or 11.4%, also highlighted here in red. Unfavorable Medicaid reimbursements accounted for almost 90% of the unfavorability in operating revenue. PACE will receive these reimbursements eventually, so this is just a timing difference. The public funding section of the dashboard shows favorable budgeted results for each. If, can I ask our participants on the phone, if you aren't commenting, to mute your phone so that we don't get all of your background noise? Thank you. The public funding section of the dashboard shows favorable budget results for each service board. The results reflect actual sales tax receipts for January, which were 3.7% higher than in 2015. The real estate transfer tax, or RET, results for the first quarter were very strong, 5.6 million or 35% favorable to budget. This was due to a windfall from the sale of the Chicago Skyway for $2.8 billion last November. This transaction produced more than $8 million of real estate transfer tax for the CTA and contributed to CTA's highlighted favorable public funding variance of 5.8%. System-wide operating expenses through March were $20.6 million, or 3.1% favorable to budget, with each service board reporting favorable results for both the month of March and for the first quarter. A quick look at the, f at, sorry, a quick look at the fuel slide will reveal that substantial fuel savings relative to budget continue to be realized by each service board. For the system, fuel savings totaled 6.1 million. Pace Suburban Service had a 12.1% favorable budget expense performance, here highlighted in blue, driven primarily by fuel savings of 2.3 million. Pace, ADA's, Pace ADA Paratransit's 10.7% favorable expense performance was driven by lower purchase transportation, followed by lower fuel and administrative expenses. Due to improved terms in their most recent provider contracts, Pace's cost per passenger trip for ADA paratransit service decreased by 3.4% from 2014 to 2015. And this savings continues into 2016. At the regional level, favorable operating expenses and public funding more than offset unfavorable operating revenue, producing a first quarter net result which was $31.5 million favorable to budget. All three service boards plus ADA paratransit had favorable net result variances in excess of 3%, highlighted here in blue, due to good expense performance and favorable public funding. CTA, Metra, and Pace Suburban Service recorded favorable recovery ratios for the first quarter while Pace ADA paratransit was just slightly unfavorable to budget. On the left, the fare recovery ratio of 35.7% includes only passenger fares. When ancillary service board revenue is included, the recovery ratio increases to 41.7% for the first quarter, and that is labeled all revenue. On the right side, we show the statutory recovery ratio labeled with credits and compare it to budget. This recovery ratio stood at 48.5% for the first quarter and it was 1.2% 1.2 percentage points favorable to budget. 
focusing on the certification of year-to-date financial results for the first quarter. This slide displays the variance of each service board's operating deficit from budget. The operating deficit is calculated by subtracting operating expenses from operating revenues and thus does not consider public funding. Each service board had a favorable variance in operating deficit. The combined operating the combined regional operating deficit was 19.8 million or 5% favorable. Thus, I recommend that the, re that the results of operations of each service board and the region taken as a whole be found in substantial accordance with the adopted budget for the first quarter of 2016. Thank you. Thank you. The, <clears throat> obviously from looking at this, the expense um, are being held down by the service boards, which is great. Ridership is off as it has been with PACE for, for the last couple of quarters. But uh, other than that, it looks like we're in pretty good shape and we certainly are in compliance with the fare box recovery ratio. Are there questions or comments from the board? Yeah, Director Hobson. Uh, yeah, one, a couple questions. Uh, one, the revised PACE forecast, was that reflected in Donna's numbers where she showed it being flat? So, so Donna would be um, comparing things to prior, comparing ridership to prior year? Well, it, it, so the, it, it, that was just strictly a comparison versus the, the previous year and it wasn't actuals for the first quarter? Okay, that, that clears that up, thank you. And then the second one has a uh, pace that you said that they revised their, uh, their ridership numbers. Have they done an overall budget revision including their 10, 11% variance in terms of uh, uh, operating expenses? No, oh, the only thing that was revised was the ridership figure. Was the, rider, the ridership figure. So that didn't flow through to their, their bottom line number? So, so it, it certainly does impact their fair per passenger or their average fare, uh, which now through the first quarter um, matches their actual pretty much. So okay. there, was no, there was no need to, to advise. To do further uh, budget adjustments on, on their or, part. Or any budget adjustment. It was just a ridership adjustment. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Other questions or comments? If not, could we have a uh, – Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. I was just looking, Bill. Um, you threw out a number early in your presentation that there are 36,000 new jobs. Was that in the downtown central business core? No, it's throughout the RTA region. Okay. Hey, hey Bill, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, uh, with regard to PACE that there was a change in the provider for fuel. Was it fuel cost? My apologies. Um, last year, they, renegoti they negotiated their provider contracts for ADA paratransit service, and these new contracts have yielded uh, reduced costs per ride. And will that continue for some time? Is there a period of time that they're locked in for? Or so th I think that the contracts are, I think, for five years? Four years? They're four-year contracts. Thank you. Okay, promotion and a second. Motion by Director DeWitt, second by Director Ferrani. Uh, roll call. Director Buchanan? Are you there? Okay, <laughs> Director Colson? Yes. Director DeWitt? Yes. <laughs> Director Lewis? Yes. Director Troiani? Yes. Director McGallis? Aye. One two more chance for Director Buchanan? Okay, well then that's five eyes and two absent still. <laughs> All right, thank you. <coughs> Item 4B is a discussion and ordinance releasing the 2017 business plan call. Bill? Good morning again. So I'm, I'm now seeking board approval to release the 2017 business plan call. The business plan call outlines for the service boards the elements required for the development of their operating budgets, two-year financial plans, and five-year capital programs. The annual business planning process begins now in May and culminates in December with board adoption of the service board budgets and capital programs. 
In 2016, our regional business plan included an annual operating budget of $2.9 billion and a five-year capital program of $3.1 billion. These amounts clearly merit careful and deliberate planning. The business plan call lays out the business planning process in detail. Through the summer and fall, the RTA and the service boards will work through each step of the process, leading to an adopted 2017 regional business plan in December. The key components of the business plan call are shown here. The regional economic outlook is the basis for the sales tax forecast, which will be used to set the funding levels for the service boards. The service boards examine their individual transportation markets and develop service plans that address the needs and opportunities of those markets. The business plan call provides sample schedules of the information that the RTA is requesting. The information includes revenues and expenses by category, recovery ratios, staffing levels, service plans, and operating statistics. These schedules are meant to serve as guides. The service boards can submit their information in the formats that they use to develop their own budgets. Our goal, however, is to obtain consistent information across the service boards so that we can present aggregated regional data. The four capital, for the capital program, the service boards will provide descriptions of projects and identify the funding sources that will support them. Through the business plan planning process, we will learn more about the issues addressed by the service boards so that we can better understand the assumptions underlying their budgets and programs. This enables us to provide sufficient information to the board to ensure that the business plans apply resources efficiently and effectively and promote the long-term financial viability of the region's public transit system. Listed here are the seven criteria for board adoption Ident for board budget adoption that are listed in the in this RTA Act. Sorry about that. Reg revenues and expenses are in balance. Cash flows are sufficient to pay expenses with reasonable promptness. Operating budgets that meet the recovery ratio requirements are based on reasonable and prudent assumptions and follow sound financial principles. Business plans that not only meet the financial, budgetary, and fiscal requirements set by the board, but also are consistent with the goals and objectives of the RTA strategic plan. The capital program is an area where we face significant challenges. There is no new state capital funding program for transportation projects, and the state has only partially funded its earlier bond programs. Our current five-year capital program includes no state funding. The capital program for each service board identifies the projects to be undertaken in the 2017 through 2021 program period within projected funding levels. For each project in the program, the service boards will outline its scope, evaluation criteria, justification, benefits, and cost. The RTA also requests that the service boards provide preliminary estimates of additional capital funding from local sources, service board funds, and service board bond proceeds planned for the five-year capital program. Using the capital optimization tool, or cost, each service board will provide an analysis of the impact of its proposed capital program on its state of good repair. To meet the requirements of federal and state law and to provide opportunities for public input, the business plan calendar includes several public meetings and presentations on the capital program development process. A couple of new new items for the 2017 business plan call. In addition to the five-year capital program, each service board is asked to provide a set of 10-year unfunded priorities for the 2017-2026 period. That is, an outline of projects that would be undertaken with additional capital funding. 
This request will help clarify how the service boards would use these funds, not only to address state of good repair needs, but also to enhance and modernize the region's transit system. Also in 2017, an exhibit has been added to the business plan call to allow the service boards to provide a project scope and justification for proposed ICE projects that they include in their capital programs or their operating budgets. ICE stands for Innovation, Coordination, and Enhancement. While this exhibit is new to the business plan, uh, this is certainly information that we have asked the service boards for in the past. A snapshot of the 2017 business plan calendar. As I mentioned, today I'm seeking board approval for the release of the 2017 business plan call. In July, the RTA will provide the service boards preliminary estimates of funding levels for discussion. The RTA will also make a presentation to the CMAP Transportation Committee on the capital programming process. On August 18th, I will present the funding amounts to the RTA board for consideration. Setting the funding amounts in August gives the, gives the service boards more time to complete their proposed business plans before submitting them to the RTA at the end of September and presenting them at public hearing in October and November. September 15th is the statutory date for the adoption of the funding amounts and November 15th is the statutory date for the service boards to submit their board adopted budgets to the RTA. On December 1st, the RTA Finance Committee will hold a special meeting to review each of the service board's budgets. On December 15th, we'll, I will present to you the consolidated regional budget for adoption. Finally, in April of 2017, the service boards will present an overview of their capital programs to the CMAP Transportation Committee and, and, and invite input regarding the development of the following year's capital program. This concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Bill. Uh, looking through the document, changes this year other than the ICE uh, section for the service boards. The, uh, actually, we've now formalized, of course, the balance and reserve fund uh, by the service boards, that they are responsible for keeping their own reserve levels and so forth, and that we're responsible only for the um, shortfall as it comes in from the state. Are there any other major changes in the document that over last year? Well, it's, it's the, um, this 10-year unfunded capital um, view, so what the service boards would do over this longer period of time okay. if they had additional money. Okay. Yes, uh, Director Lewis. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we at the December meeting talked about um, what would happen if, in fact, the funding levels from the state weren't approved? And in this document, we don't reflect that. I know we've got a two-year and a you know, longer five-year and a ten-year view, but I didn't know if we, in this document, would reflect that language or if that's something that would be um, separate from that document. Because we did ask that question at the December meeting of every one of the agencies, and they attested. So it's kind of the corollary to the reserve being managed by the service boards. Um, the ability to manage through the uncertainty of the budget process. So I just raised the question um, um, in terms of whether it should be reflected here or, Bill, if you think it should be reflected elsewhere. So, I'm sorry, is your question about what would the service boards do with additional operating no, funds? No, What would happen if the um, budget didn't pass? So they would have, um, they wouldn't have the funding uh, to provide the services. At the December meetings, uh, the chair asked of each of the service boards, what would you do if, in fact, there was not, there was a budgetary impasse in terms of managing, and their statement was, we would, you know, figure out a way to uh, adjust so that we would be able to operate at some reduced level. And my question was, this document doesn't reflect that. Was that by design, or uh, is it something we should consider? Well, um, it, it doesn't, no, it doesn't reflect that, um, but as... So, 
can, if I can just jump in. I mean, this, this document doesn't reflect it in the sense that this doesn't really have any of the numbers in it yet. This is really just the kickoff, really, for the calendar and the schedule and the process, telling the service boards what information we're looking for. None of those sort of numbers begin to even sort of be bookended um, until we get to August when we actually set the marks, which is sort of the assumed funding that we expect for 2016. And then at least by then we'll have some sense what the legislature does potentially by May 31st. If nothing, we'll at least know they've done nothing. Um, and then we've got that picture. And the, the state fiscal year is on a different timeline to our fiscal year as well. Um, on the capital side, there is zero dollars assumed in the five-year outlook, as Bill said, on the capital side. So we're assuming nothing unless they give us something. So I think um, in broad strokes, we've, we have a, we're all aware of it. It's accommodated in this year's budget. The, uh, we've assumed, um, <clears throat> and, but we've assumed the monies um, that we're supposed to be getting from the state will continue to flow as they have been, albeit a little delayed. Um, but beyond that, you know, we don't really lock anything down until we get into August time frame. Uh, I understand, Leanne. In, in this document, to a certain extent, is a philosophical approach in terms of how they will approach the budgets. I just didn't know if, in light of what's going on, if we would have a responsibility to at least note or make some um, <coughs> acknowledgement that this is a contingency, and then if it does, in fact, um, you know, pass, then mm -hmm. we can certainly strike that from it. So it's a question, it's not a requirement. I just wanted to raise the issue. Director Lewis, I, I, to answer your question also, I think the um, reserve and balance fund policy, that's now made part of this document. And it, what it requires is for the service boards to present as part of their uh, response to this document, what their fund balance is and what their reserve plan is. So you and I would be able to now look at that and go, wait a minute. So they've got $30 million in reserves. We've got a net potential loss from fare box recovery ratio of $80 million, for example. We'd be able to make some analysis now by this new policy of at least getting the what they see their reserves being. If their reserves are down to nothing, then we know we've got a major problem. So they are now required to tell us those reserve amounts as part of the response to this document the first time. Yes, Director Hobson. Uh, yeah, Bill, I'd like to go back to your business plan call budget criteria slide. Mm -hmm. um, the assumption or the philosophy behind that slide seems to me that all the, the, the fare box recovery is all intended for purely operations. And there's nothing assumed, at least in the you know the lines that I see here. You know, for example, revenue and expenses in balance. Well, if you throw capital in there, clearly they're not going to be in balance. Uh, meets recovery ratio. Yes, it meets the statutory recovery ratio, but does it meet the recovery ratio to cover capital improvements and things like that? Well, clearly it does not, because you know the, the executive director and our chairman are doing a fantastic job they're going around asking for capital dollars. So there's clearly a problem with capital dollars. What I'd like to see is maybe a philosophical shift uh, and given some thought to the, the fares that all three service boards charge to include a portion for uh, capital recovery in, in those fares. And I, I don't think from at least the brief period I've been here, a couple years that I've been here, that thought isn't there. All the fares are considered for or for operating expenses, and I would like to at least have some analysis from the service boards calling for what would we want to do to fares or what could we do to fares to start making contributions to the capital shortfall. Could you ask them to include something like that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> what an overwhelming response from, from the staff. Um, I, I'd also like to point out that, that Metra in the past has has designated some of their fair revenue for capital. And I think we see a surplus on Metra's side because of that, uh, because of their price increase that they did in February. And that, uh, I hope they're not going to use that for operating, but they are going to ship some of those dollars over to capital. Uh, but I think that uh, CTA and PACE might want to follow. I, I understand there's all sorts of political things in there involved in that, but I would at least, at least the service boards from a business plan perspective to consider that and say what are the scenarios where or, uh, that we could raise fares and could contribute some to the capital program. Is that something that we could ask the service boards to provide? It certainly is something we can ask for, yes. 
<laughs> right. The uh, one, one of the things on the previous charts that we looked at was the fare box, the actual fare box recovery ratio is at like 37 percent, which is far, you know, a big gap between that 37 percent and the actual cost of that ride. And I don't think a lot of the riders realize that. And fortunately now we've added that to the graph that, that we can easily look at it and see the, what the shortfall is. Um, and one of the problems you've got with trying to, if you raise the revenue from the fare box, is that they're going to say, well, it's only 37%. We need to come closer to the actual cost. But I think it's a great idea that we need to look for new ways of finding how to fund capital. And certainly whether, I mean, it's a, it's a bargain that the rate right people are able to utilize transit at 37% of the cost. If they had to pay 100%, can you imagine? <laughs> the, the problems we would have, but that's something we ought to look at. Yeah, uh, I think you're right. I mean, we're looking at the different sources of funding. We're looking at the federal. We're looking at state. We're looking at taxpayers. I think we ought to cons also consider looking at riders. We should leave no stone unturned in terms of looking for revenue and uh, operating funds. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Yes, Director Colson. I noticed that the information requirements include long-term debt, and I don't know exactly what that means, but I think we need every time a service board wants to issue new debt, that ought to be in there. And uh, more than that, there ought to be also a macro analysis of where that leaves the overall debt that with system phases, because debt has a way of creeping up on all of us, especially governments. Um, and I, I think we, for example, we should not ever again see a 30-year note uh, being issued for 12-year buses. I, I just don't think that's sustainable. And then following up on the earlier comments, the reduced fare costs. Um, can the service boards tell us by category how much it, the, the various reduced fares and free rides are costing? Because I noticed the average, um, the fare revenue per trip is $1.56 through the whole system. And I know it costs two fifty to get on the CTA, and it cost me 6 bucks from Glenview. Something's bringing that average way, way down to $1.56, and that's got to be the reduced fares and the free fares, I see. But it's, it's also transfers. Okay, well. And, and, and uh, time-delimited passes. Okay, it would be helpful to know how much re these various reduced fares by category are costing us, because not all of them are compelled by federal law. And I understand that we're not going to get any state reimbursement for some of them. We ought to consider eliminating them. But maybe they can quantify what that's costing the service boards. We'll that find would, out. That would be helpful. And, and just as far as, as the debt issuances are concerned, there's there's an exhibit J in the um, in the business plan call which specifically asks for many of the parameters around their proposed debt issuances. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Not we have a, a motion and a second. And by the way, thanks uh, for the great job of getting out and working with the service boards and, and because it does have their input and their support at this point that's my understanding is that correct Bill? yes okay well, that's that's really great so if we have a motion and a second motion by director lewis second by director dewitt all uh, roll call director colson yes. director dewitt yes. director lewis yes. director triani aye director mcgallis aye i'm going to try one more time on director buchanan Five. Ah, there you go. Okay. Six eyes and one absent. <laughs> if there's no other business to come before the committee, uh, I'd like a motion to adjourn. <laughs> motion by Director Durrani, second by Director Lewis. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Nice. Aye. Aye. Ayes have it. We're adjourned. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. We'll call this meeting of the uh, Regional Transportation Authority, uh, our regular monthly meeting, uh, to order. And uh, let's uh, begin with uh, Pledge of Allegiance, if we may. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God.
Thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Certainly. Director Anderson? Director Buchanan? Here. And that is on the phone with the proper paperwork completed and submitted. Director Colson? Here. Director DeWitt? Here. Director Durani? Here. Director Frega? Here. Director Fuentes? Here. Director Hobson? Here. Director Lewis? Here. Director McGallis? Here. Director Melvin? Here. Director Pang? Here. Director Ross? Here. Director Totten? Here. Director Triani? Here. Chairman Dillard? Present. We have a quorum of 15 present with one absent. Great. Thank you. Uh, the first order of business, as usual, is the approval of the minutes from the last meeting which was held on April 21st, 2016. Any comments or questions? If not, may I have a motion to approve those minutes? Um, Director Frigga uh, moves that we approve the minutes uh, from April 21, 2016, seconded by Director Patrick Durante. Uh, let's uh, take a roll call on this.